Well, just three months into the year, a global outbreak hit home and the country was left battling an unseen enemy that forced the government to shut down and residents on lockdown. As the Chinese government scrambles to contain the virus, the U.S. Embassy in Beijing confirms the first American death, a 60-year-old who died in Wuhan. Breaking news, the first death from coronavirus here in the United States. A man in his 50s dying from COVID-19 infection in Washington state. That's when we started to prepare because we knew it would be here soon. As the coronavirus made its way to the Bahamas, it claimed the life of its first victim. For the first time in the country's history, the Bahamas was placed on a lockdown that was announced through an emergency order. We have seen a doubling of confirmed cases over the last four days. We anticipate more cases in a short period of time over the coming 20 days. And this suggests that we are at the beginning of an expected surge. The disease is spreading even more rapidly. Okay, Bimini is a hot spot. Let's get Robbie Smith on the line. She comes. There's an ongoing discussion on what needs to happen with Bimini at this point, as we've seen a rise in cases. They're just ready to do what they have to do to make this thing go away, just like the rest of the world, as quickly as possible. Bimini is a close knitted community and close family. For me, there's no logic in lockdown Bimini and give me a reason. A scientific reason, who would say, because the virus is spread, because Bimini is small. Well, the virus is spreading in Nassau. What we wanted to do was actually plan it to make sure that no one panicked, to make sure that everyone had what they needed. And for the first time, this island was placed on a two-week lockdown. After consultation with health and other officials, including officials on Bimini, that Bimini will be placed on a two-week lockdown in order to slow and control the community spread of the COVID-19 virus on this island. We are resilient people and I believe that we're going to come through this and we're going to come through this together. The Grand Bahama and Abaco subsequently would also suffer the same fate as a result of rising cases. Our duty tonight is to go out on the streets to execute it's the third night of curfew and things are relatively quiet here in Freeport. On East Sunrise Highway and Coral Road, right here is one of the local checkpoints for police officials. The first persons we encountered after nine was a man who was on the side of the road, stuck after curfew with a flat tire. I don't have $10,000 to give away. Do you think the police would be lenient if they catch you? I think so now. now. Yeah. Why now? You guys are here. You exempt or you're not exempt? You pause. How far do you have to go? Queens Highway? It's after nine. We have taken 20 persons into custody for various offenses, including being in possession of uh, offensive instrument, unlawfully carrying arms, uh, in breach of the curfew, uh, in breach of liquor license and uh, other offenses. There will now be a weekday curfew from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. on Abaco and New Providence beginning next week, Tuesday. No, and I repeat, no social gatherings will be permitted whatsoever. And the police will be aggressive for the pursuing those aggressively in the case of any Airbnb. We're very, you know, thankful about that. Uh, if this had been a, you know, a two-week total lockdown, I think the, the, the effects would have been much more severe and negative. Residents flocked to the food stores, buying in a way that was never seen before. So what am I, bro? What you dealing with, bro? Streets were extremely busy on Tuesday morning on Grand Bahama as residents rushed to the various stores to purchase items. The persons were out from 4.35 o'clock, some came 6, and because they came at 6, they tried to get early in the line. The line has been extremely slow. There are seniors who have been standing in line, some of them are now getting fatigued, and uh, that's, that's a basic problem. I've been out here now going on 6 hours just waiting to get some groceries. 
This is terrible. This is not protecting anybody. Nobody here is practicing social distancing. Actually, the little grocery stores are practicing better social distancing than this here, what, what we're looking at. When we lined up this morning at 5.30, we were number 64 in line. By the time it was seven o'clock, we were number 180 in line because over 200 people pushed through the middle of the line and they're letting in people who are under 60 and people who are disabled were forced to walk to the back of the line. That's not right. The local financial institutions can only open on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It is about the fact that we are in a lockdown and we do not have access to our money. The ATM machine, uh, uh, two of the banks, Scotia and Royal Bank, not taking deposit, you can't withdraw money, ATM machines are empty. How are we supposed to survive in a lockdown if we do not have access to our money? If the bank has been taking any checks, many persons who got paid on the Thursday before the lockdown got paid in checks. Some people got paid in checks since then and have not been able to deposit cash or withdraw. Something is wrong with well, that. I do not understand how it is that the police officer can come and close down this establishment when you have in total 16 people. You have 12 to go in BAF and you have four to go at money ground. People are babies. One woman left me crying. Tears from her eyes. I'm not able to get my NIB contribution and my family was able to send me a few dollars to even do anything, it is, this is terrible. After months of being locked down, businesses also started to feel the pinch and unemployment skyrocketed. Every day you still have your bills to pay, you have your overheads to pay. While the store is closed, you still have those bills to, that are running, so it's a good thing. But we just have to continue to do what the, the Prime Minister and the health officials said to do, to be safe as much as we can, and then we have to leave the rest to God. Our businesses employ uh, eight to ten people, so uh, you have like ten families surviving from a small business like this. Imagine if everybody is closed and nobody's making no money. Uh, hardly anybody could survive like that. It's been a tough year because out of the whole year we've been closed basically around seven to eight months. To be open, we are indeed grateful and thankful that our doors are open because with our doors closed, there's no chance of d doing any business. But once now that we are able to open our doors, we are able, to, the public is now able to come in and shop. But at presently, it's not a, it's a, it, it's a little slow, but we look forward to better days. A lot of persons are trying their best to get stuff for their kids and computers, laptops and stuff like that, things like that have always been requested. But the difficulty is getting them from the states right now to bring them in. We normally do a system as a 30 day turnover and because we was closed so long, we don't have anything to turn over to bring out. So we're giving people an opportunity to pay for their stuff because of COVID. The back to school season, we could see the stress on the person's face uh, when they come in there to rush and get things for their kids. But um, it's just a situation that we're living in and we're taking it one day at a time. Fair spiral that with a country locked down, there may have been shortage as it was seen throughout the world, particularly when it came to meat. Fast food chain Wendy's becoming the latest company to feel the effects of a pandemic triggered meat shortage. Thus far, we have not experienced any shortages as far as us getting the meat that we need. Meat companies in the United States have warned that the country's food supply is in peril. President Donald J. Trump recently took action, signing an executive order providing the authority to ensure the continued supply of beef, pork, and poultry to the American people. But the country suffered tremendously, particularly in the tourism sector. We've seen a cancellation so far. It's uh, something that um, we've never seen. The time when I arrived, uh, uh, guests in particular, you know, sometimes some of them is coming inside your car, coughing and sneezing. Come close to me, bam, you're dead. Coronavirus, leave 99 more to go. Before the proposed general opening of our borders on the 1st of July, it is intended that there be a phased opening of the tourism sector prior to this date. You gotta come in with their negative uh, PCR tests. And if you're here doing the fifth date, they obviously have to take uh, an antigen test. And basically we're trying to keep ourselves safe and we're trying to keep them safe as well, coming here in the Grand Bahama Island. 
Well, after months of curfews, lockdowns and quarantine, it wouldn't be long before residents grew wary of being locked down and many pastors advocated that churches should be reopened. The medical profession keeps saying the best thing you could do is wear the mask, keep your distance and, and sanitize regularly. So if that's it, um, uh, why are, are you continuing to lock us down? We're being treated as if we are from some outer, outer planet and we have no discipline whatsoever. Uh, and I, so I, I just want to endorse what Pastor Lockhart said. The people that are in the food stores and at the hardware stores that are obeying the social distancing, these are the same people that are sitting in our congregation. I think even after this lockdown is finished, I don't think, I think social distancing will still be practiced. Mm -hmm. um, even after the lockdown is finished and the whole country is opened up again, I believe that social distancing is not going to leave us right away. The Disaster Reconstruction Authority hosted a mass burial nine months later for 55 bodies that were found post-Dorian on the island of Abaco. I don't know what happened and how our loved ones came to their change, but I know it was on the 1st of September 2019. Their change came. I don't know what time it was, but their change came. Somebody asked, Preacher, well, how do you know? Well, I can't assure you, but I know one thing, that bad things still happen to good people. Among us, we have some children, some old and some young. But I know we have a loving father who loved them all and who cared for them. I know today that they are safe with him. And so I want to encourage my people to be strong. Pray for these families. Pray for those who, who mourn today. Uh, and pray for our island. Pray for our country. But the service was widely criticized. Crowds gathered under the assumption that their missing loved ones were in one of the many caskets. Many complained that they were not allowed near the caskets, among other concerns. But the DRA defended the organization of the mass burial during a press conference held via Zoom. The conference comes amidst growing controversy from relatives of the deceased and the concerned citizens regarding the handling of the burial service and the challenge to positively identify victims. This was and is an ongoing exercise and multiple trips to Abaco were made to examine victims as already stated. Each victim had a unique identifying number and that was part of that case that went on the demographic data, on the body, on the bag, on the photographs, on the specimens submitted. We were able to fingerprint all of the recovered bodies. Those prints were run in our AFIS, a machine. We got no match on any of the fingerprints. We then rely on dental records. That was also a process that we engage our forensic teams with, we were unsuccessful, and finally, we moved to the DNA stage. Meanwhile, here on Grand Bahama, the Grand Bahama Port Authority hosted a special unveiling ceremony to honor those who had perished during Hurricane Dorian. That special ceremony taking place right here at the Sir Jack Hayward Bridge. It is together as a resilient community standing shoulder to shoulder in support and brotherhood that we recover, heal, and carry on as we Bahamians are known to do. We are thankful for where the Lord has brought us from one year ago. We are thankful for the lives that those persons who died lived. We are thankful for the memories that we have we are thankful for those who have survived. We are thankful for the rebuilding that has taken place. When all was said and done, prayers and support were offered to the families who lost their loved ones during the tragic storm. We'll now go to our Italia Hall who picks up the ceremonies in McLean's Town and High Rock.
It was a sad occasion for many in the McLeanstown community as persons remembered the lives of family members and friends who lost their lives during Hurricane Dorian. I want to thank all of our partners who have continued to assist residents here in East End to help rebuild lives, to help put residents back in some form where they can go back to work. We thank you for this moment in time. On this historical moment here in the settlement of McLeanstown, Grand Bahama, we give you thanks and we give you praise for all those who have been in the hurricane and all those who have become victims and the family. While Grand Bahama saw an escalation of fraud-related matters, according to police, the murder rate and overall crime was down during the pandemic. This morning, the men believed to be responsible for a in Mastery court, court number one. Upon arrival here, they met the lifeless body of a male. We have found that these persons um, are usually not gainfully employed or have not been employed for a very long time, and they provide job letters to the court indicating that they are employed. And this, of course, is false information. Word to the wise is efficient, so please do not continue this practice. And if there are any improprieties, um, the law will come down hard upon you. One peculiar case, though, was a family crying out for justice after their loved ones alleged that the murderer was given bail and then went missing. The pain bellowed from this grandmother as she learned that the man accused of allegedly stabbing her granddaughter to death last September now has a warrant issued for his arrest, even after he was granted bail. I, I don't know. I, I hope I just saying I hope I don't say him. That's all I say. I hope I don't say him. But I hope the law, I hope they straighten up and, you know, try to solve this. Monet Darble was brutally murdered in September. Her alleged killer was charged in December and given bail some two months later. According to sources, bail was granted to the suspect because he is confined to a wheelchair and is considered a reduced risk to abscond. The family also producing a video of Hannah, who is a physical education coach by profession, walking around and conducting a training session. Go, what? Now, according to police, all murder-related matters of 2020 have been solved. However, there are still some heart-wrenching stories, even traffic fatalities, that completely gripped this island. Police officials finding the body of a man stuffed in a bin inside a bedroom in a house in the Lewis Yard community. EMS personnel will call, checking uh, that male for life, negative results. As a result, we have an investigation of what we suspect to be a murder. Officers quickly responded, and upon arrival here, they met the lifeless body of a male with multiple gunshot wounds to the body lying on the streets. Our initial investigations revealed that the male, while riding his bicycle in the area, was approached by a gunman who opened fire upon him. The male, who was well known to police, um, succumbed here at the scene. A shooting incident happened here yesterday on Limewood Lane that claimed the lives of two persons. Changes have to happen. We then in crisis, huh? You understand? And like I just want the public to know that this shooting would happen to here. I don't make steps and get killing that. This ain't get nothing to do with us. We could solve our differences totally much better in our country and in our inner cities than picking up a gun. It's alarming to see that they get into the stage where they actually can take a, a young woman's life. She celebrated Mother's Day Sunday, Sunday okay. and today is her birthday and now she's dead. She has six, seven young, young kids now without a mother. Onlookers describe the sight as awfully tragic. Police say a male driver of a champagne-colored GMC Yukon vehicle was speeding traveling east and lost control. On arrival at the scene, officers discovered that an accident occurred involving a GMC um, Econo SUV vehicle that was traveling east on Grand Bahama Highway. Apparently, the vehicle had lost control, ran off the no northern side of the street, and overturned. 
Um, from what we understand, one person has succumbed to injuries. Uh, the vehicle at the time was occupied by five passengers, including the driver. Now you may recall, a young man lost his life while driving on East Sunrise Highway. Officers say that speed was indeed a factor in that traffic mishap as well. Pinder is appealing to all road users to wear a seatbelt and refrain from drinking and driving. If you're going to drink, please have a designated driver, someone that is responsible enough to ensure that you get home safely. Just when most thought it couldn't get any worse, here comes an impending storm that threatened the Bahamas in August. The name was one most couldn't pronounce, but when it was all said and done, Hurricane Isaiah really wasn't a threat. On Sunday morning, the National Emergency Management Agency issued an all clear for the entire Bahamas, adding that residents should be cautious due to possible severe weather conditions. However, at 9 a.m., residents in the northern Bahamas were still being affected by Tropical Storm Isaias. Although the all clear was given early Sunday morning, Minister Lewis notes that this was not a signal for residents to ride around the island sightseeing. He says the all clear was given for utility workers and essential workers to conduct their rapid assessments. Now, as you notice, a lot of pockets across the island were flooded. Minister Lewis says this could put residents in danger if they do not remain at home. Hurricane Isaias, in, pre in preparation for that, we did a major cleanup from east to west. And that, that was in the area of $2 million also. And all of that, all of the work was done by local contractors. And they show us now that we have local capacity. They have the equipment, they have the machinery, they have the skill set um, um, to, to collect and manage debris on the island of Grand Bahama. So, so we, are, we are better positioned now from a, an because of experience and because of, of the assets that the local contractor now, contractors now own. Well, the northern Bahamas escaped with minimal to no damage, but an impact of a new kind with great environmental implications came about. Oil dumping in Grand Bahama. Several bags containing what is believed to be commercial grade oil was discovered near Barberry Beach. Maybe the truck broke down, something happened that should not have happened. It is unconscionable that we as intelligent Bahamians would just drop oil and create a mess on the side of the road. The person or persons that are responsible for the abuse of the environment who would have dumped oil on the side of the road. Uh, in, in East Grand Bahama. This is something that has significant damage to our environment. So we're going to consult with uh, attorneys and maybe also the AG office in regards to what charges will be implemented against them. Police took two young men before the court in connection with that illegal dumping of oil that took place in East Grand Bahama. Richard Antonio Levy Jr., age 25, and Morrison Nelson, age 26, on the charge of discharging a hazardous substance of the Environmental Planning and Protection Act 2019. They both pled not guilty and the matter was adjourned to February 5, 2020 for trial. Bail was granted in the amount of $4,000 with one shorty. And perhaps the biggest story of the year is the resignation of the former Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, K. Peter Turnquist. Calls for Turnquist's resignation came as he and a former business associate have been accused of defrauding a company of over $30 million through wire transfers and fraudulent invoices in a Supreme Court writ. In a statement released by Turnquest, he said the writ does not name him as a defendant, but makes several allegations in its statement of claims that he said are false. We spoke to these residents about Turnquest's decision, and they say they believe he did the honorable thing. I feel that, um, you know, he did the right thing until it's cleared up. But before we judge him, I think we ought to let the law take its course and follow due process. But him being the deputy prime minister and your name to come up in a scandal like that right now, I think it was a better choice for him to step down until he is proven innocent. He said he will continue to serve out his term as the member of parliament for East Grand Bahama, adding that when he met with the prime minister, he informed him that while he is confident that once the allegations against him 
has been fully ventilated through the courts, his reputation of transparency and accountability will be vindicated. Prime Minister, the most honorable Dr. Hubert Minnis, has accepted Turnquest's resignation. In a statement, Dr. Minnis thanked Turnquest for his service to the Bahamas, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Minnis will serve as Interim Minister of Finance and says he will make a substantive appointment in due course. The Honorable Desmond Bannister, the Minister of Works, will become Deputy Prime Minister. And the announcement then later came that Minister of State for Grand Bahama Kwesi Thompson would be appointed Minister of State for Finance. As Minister of State for Finance, I have asked him to fo focus on the economic needs and recovery of Grand Bahama, Family Island development, and the ongoing digital transformation of the Bahamas and that of the government. In 2020, the hope to start anew began with rebuilding homes, communities, and buildings after Hurricane Doreen left many homeless, missing, and fared dead. Grand Bahama Island's premier healthcare facility was extensively damaged, along with homes, the docks, the police station, the clinic, administrative offices, among many other public and private entities in East Grand Bahama. The work also began to renovate and repair schools. The Rand Memorial Hospital is getting a much needed facelift as construction work continues at the healthcare facility. Today, we are seeing the demolition of the accident and emergency, the old accident and emergency. We've been waiting for quite a long time and our end is near, we can see it. Our construction team, the whole project is being driven by not only Bahamians but Grand Bahamians. So from the perspective of job creation, that is another exciting um, component of this project. So um, it, it is well on the way and as the minister and as a Grand Bahamian, I'm extremely pleased with what I see. 15 schools on Grand Bahama slated for major repairs. Minister of Education, the Honorable Jeffrey Lloyd, traveling to Grand Bahama for the contract signing ceremony. We expect that this work begins immediately. And we have every confidence because of the extraordinary capability and commitment and dedication of the members whom we have chosen and have been selected to carry out this work. Residents were doing their best to start afresh as they were hard at work making repairs to their homes. I think it's going to give Eastend the opportunity to bounce back and come back in a new way. You know, give Eastend the opportunity to evolve. And that's what I'm looking for, not only business-wise, but even as a community. I feel hopeful that, that, that this will be a bigger and better settlement. A brief ceremony with major significance for the island of Grand Bahama. Member of Parliament for the West Grand Bahama and Bimini constituency, Pakisha parker Etchigam says that the victory and completion of the causeway does not belong to any party, but those who fought long and hard to inspire change. There was a group of men, leaders of their communities from the East and West, called the Grand Bahama Citizens Committee in the early days, who long advocated for an upgrade to the Fishing Hole Road, calling for a bridge and meetings held with the likes of Wallace Groves. We took our time. We ensure that the lines were properly in. The reflectors are in. The guardrails are in. The lights are in. And to ensure that even as we open this causeway, if we need to put additional safety mechanism in, like safe rumble strips, we will put those in to ensure that we do not lose any life. Spanning 900 feet across the Hawksbill Creek, with a lifespan of 50 years, sitting 12 feet above the main sea level, and able to withstand hurricanes up to Category 5 intensity. And the total cost of construction amounted to $9.2 million. And that was a look at some of the biggest stories in the North for the year 2020. A year that brought with it surprises, its share of frustration, uncertainty, and a devastating blow for the world at large. There were many who did not live to see how it all ended. But the hope is that 2021 ushers in a promising, healthier future, a brand new year of hope, opportunities, and prosperity. I'm Shashina Wolf-Arkison, wishing you 
a prosperous new year.